Hello, my name is Martin Nielsen and I'm a horse parasitologist and welcome here to my lab. This is the fourth episode of this video series, The Journey, The Parasite Journey Through the Horse's Life. So we're going with the parasites in the order of appearance uh, through the horse's life. So if you haven't yet watched the other three episodes, I do recommend you go back and watch those. Today's parasite is a really, really exciting parasite for me. I often refer to it as my pet parasite. It's the one I've worked with uh, the most and I did my entire PhD on it. So I'm really excited to share this knowledge with you uh, today. So today we're gonna talk about large strong jaws. And so that's something you might hear a lot. We learned about the small strong jaws in episode three. So now we're gonna go with our cousins here uh, in the large strong jaw group. Now, when we talk about large strong jaws, there's actually several different species, up to 16 that can all infect the horse, but we're really only, primarily only interested in one. And that's the one we call the blood worm. Now again, if you watched the last episode, you have now learned that there's no such thing as small blood worms. There are only blood worms, and you don't have to call them large blood worms because there's only this one kind. So the blood worm, Strongylus vulgaris in Latin, that's one of the large strong jaws. Now, I actually have a few specimen jars here. Um, they are 3D mounted. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some pictures here on the screen in a bit. But this is actually some female um, Strongylus vulgaris, so female parasites that um, have about this size. They're a little bit longer than a centimeter, maybe 15 millimeters. Uh, and uh, those were the females. So here we have some boys uh, of the blood worm. They are a little bit smaller. That's always the case when it comes to uh, parasites in general. So these over here are actually a little bit larger. Um, these are the cousin. We call them the flank worm. They're closely related to our blood worms. They don't migrate in the blood and they're called Strongylus edentatus, a little bit larger as you notice. And just for comparison, I've made this point before. These are the small strongylus. I don't know if you can even see them here, uh, but they are just in comparison so much smaller. Um, I can also show you this picture where we have a good close up of them right here. Again, making the point that you may see large strong jaw parasites in the, in the poop of your horse in case it should have them, but you may not uh, have a good enough eye to see these smaller strong jaws. So that's, um, that's one important point about this parasite. And the other one I want to make is they all make the exact same type of parasite egg. We call that, yes, a strong jaw egg. So whether it's small strong jaws or large strong jaws, the eggs all look the same. And here's an example. So we can't use the shape, the size, whatever of these eggs to tell them apart or to say whether or not there could be any blood worms around. We have diagnostic methods developed specifically for detecting blood worms in horses. Uh, there is a DNA detection method. We call that a PCR. Uh, there is a blood method where we measure antibodies in the blood sample against the blood worm. And then there is the larval culture where we take those parasite eggs and let them develop into larval stages that we can then tell apart. And then looking at specific morphological characteristics, we can say whether this horse has blood worms or not. And so talk to your veterinarian about how to test for blood worms in case you have a concern that some of your horses may have or have had uh, those parasites. And so the exciting section of these videos for me is always talking about the life cycle. I am a true parasitologist. And every time I say this life cycle is really fascinating and unique, and you're going to go, well, he said that about the last parasite too. Yeah, but that's because they all have unique characteristics that actually sets them apart somewhat. So let's look at this chart. Yeah, at a first glance, it kind of looks like the small strong jaws we covered in the last video. You have this direct straight life cycle. You have that one route of infection. That's the fecal oral route. So horses are eating grass that's contaminated with poop 
and parasitic larvae, and then they get infected that way. Now, the exciting part is what happens once these larvae are inside the horse. Now, the blood worms, yeah, you can try and guess, they make it into the blood. So they migrate and make their way into the intestinal uh, blood vessels, and then they migrate upstream all the way up to the aorta, which is the main blood vessel that's supplying the entire body of the animal. And then uh, they hang out there in that area and the main branches that are right there off of the aorta for about four months. So this parasite is sort of a slowly grinding, taking its time kind of a parasite that isn't ever in any rush. Uh, and it grinds through this development and migration and long journey and it changes a stage a couple times while in, in these blood vessels. After about four months, it starts thinking about, well, I think it's time to settle and get back and find myself a nice cute wife or, or husband. And then they uh, take their slide basically the vessel tree, uh, and they get uh, basically just transported passively down to the intestine again, <clears throat> and then they make it inside the intestinal lumen, and that's where um, they get um, their cute little offspring. That all together takes six months for the bloodworm parasite. That's a long time um, for all of that to happen, and actually the bloodworm that's the quick one when you talk about the large darn jaws. So, you know, the faint worm over here can take almost a year uh, to complete its life cycle. So these, these, these large darn jaws, they are in no hurry. They take their time. So a difference between the large drawn jaws and the small drawn jaws is also that you may remember that arrested development. You Remember me talking about the teenagers that are hanging out in their rooms and only coming down for the whenever they want some food? Yeah, and they can stop and halt that life cycle and put it on hold for periods of time. Yeah, that's unique to the small strong jaws. The large strong jaws haven't figured out to do that. Or you could argue they don't need to because you know with a lengthy migration phase of several months, the timing is actually quite perfect. Horses acquire the parasites over the course of a grazing season. And then when that season is over, then all of that migration, that happens during the winter months. And by about the time of spring, uh, when the horses are turned out on pasture again and the grass is growing and everything is warm and nice, that's when these parasites are back in the intestine and cranking out those eggs that can come out with the feces. Now, the external phase, uh, that development from egg to third stage parasitic larvae, that infective stage, that's identical to the small strong jaws. So if you're wondering about what are the factors affecting that, how long will these larvae survive, that whole discussion, go back and watch episode three. It's the exact same for the large strong jaws. So how common are bloodworms nowadays? And, you know, if you go to the grocery store, you might, um, over there in the, in the fishing uh, aisle, you might find bait that is labeled bloodworm. It's not the same as this. Uh, it's totally different, but if you Google the word bloodworm, that might show up. Now, the bloodworms in the horses are very, very rare nowadays. Um, or they are rare as long as people deworm their horses. Now, some herds of horses, like wild horses, that never get dewormed, they have bloodworms. Our research herd here at the University of Kentucky, yeah, the one that has not been dewormed since 1979, all of those horses have bloodworms. Now, I should remember to say that none of our research horses have ever had any parasitic disease that can be associated with bloodworms, or any other worm for that matter, so that's just food for thought. Um, so, but once you start deworming, you will see the, the occurrence of bloodworm really decline dramatically. And in many, many herds, in many equine operations uh, around the world, this parasite is virtually non-existent or it is prevalent at a very, very low level. Um, if you don't deworm very often, and there is a critical point to where you might actually be deworming too little, then there is a risk of this parasite coming back. And we've documented this in our research. 
And if you look at the American Association for Equine Practitioners, that's the horse veterinarians in the US, we have a guideline document for how to approach parasite control. And we do talk about the minimum number of dewormings a horse needs uh, in any given year. And that is primarily to keep the blood worms away. So you can look that up or talk to a veterinarian about what the current recommendations are for deworming horses. Um, and if you, if you keep those, you're unlikely to actually ever encounter a blood worm. But as I discussed earlier, uh, there are ways to test for it. And, and you can talk to a veterinarian about testing your horses. If you think you might have had some blood worms or if uh, a horse had any kind of disease that could be associated with blood worms. So the other thing that's worth uh, remembering, and this is something we know from our herd of horses that all have blood worms, is that the older these horses get, the fewer the worms they have. And once they get up to you know, certain adult age, a lot of them actually don't have any blood worms at all. So there's some kind of self-vaccination going on. You can say that the parasite kind of works as a vaccine against itself. And you can argue, well, from a parasite standpoint, that might not be the smartest thing to do. Um, and maybe it's because it sort of overdid it a little bit. Do you really have to migrate in the blood system for four months? Is that really necessary, blood worm? Um, maybe not, but, you know, but it's still around. So uh, apparently it works for the blood worm and uh, you know, then we can't really criticize it for it. But it kind of vaccinates the horses. And so if horses are exposed, eventually they will become quite immune to this parasite. So. Talking about disease, you know, this horse, uh, sorry, this parasite is, um, if, you, if you read the books and the old textbooks and articles, it, it's often called the most dangerous parasite of horses. It's been called the horse killer. You know, here's one example of an article that was published in 1975. Um, and, and there's something to that. There are some distinct lesions that this parasite can cause. So, we uh, look here at a, a normal horse. Here is the aorta with, the, with those holes that are the main branches, completely beautiful looking, uh, smooth, pale white. There is nothing that interrupts that blood flow uh, in this picture. And then here's a picture from a horse that's infected. Um, you can see, well, there is an obvious difference here. It kind of looks like a marinara meat sauce kind of scenario that this parasite is, is causing. And, and actually, it's interesting that this in itself really doesn't cause any discomfort or disease. It's just a reaction that the horse is mounting to uh, the parasite. And there's a lot of blood clot formation building around the parasite. But what happens in very rare cases is that some of these uh, pieces of blood clot and actually even sometimes the parasites themselves, when they're carried downstream and getting ready to make it back to the large intestine, uh, they can clog some of those blood vessels, basically occlude them, uh, put a cork in the, in the vessel, and then there's a whole segment of intestine that doesn't get its oxygen and nutrient supply. And when a piece of tissue, regardless of what it is, does not get enough oxygen and nutrient, it will die. And, and that process, we call it necrosis, is very painful to the horse at first, but then the stuff dies and that actually it becomes numb right there. But then you have a piece of intestinal wall that no longer is vital, no longer is active, and the bacteria can grow over it and get into the abdominal cavity and then cause infection and inflammation there. And so that's what causes the disease. Here's a picture of a piece of intestine with, with that lighter area there. That's the dead tissue where uh, the, the, the intestinal wall no longer has that oxygen supply. This process, when that happens, is life-threatening to the horse. It can be fixed, it can be cured, but it often takes surgery to do that and surgery as early as possible. Now, this happens extremely rarely, and if you don't see the parasite at all, uh, you don't have anything to worry about. And once again, I said this before, our research herd, we have 20 horses in that research herd. We've, he we've kept it since 1979. We have never seen a single case of this. 
even though they all get stone jealous vulgaris. So that's just food for thought. It is not in the interest of the parasite to kill the horse. That's kind of stupid. Now, this parasite may not be the smartest. I already said that it's vaccinating itself against itself, and that also doesn't seem like a smart strategy. And so, but this is how it works. And uh, when it comes to treatment, um, then we actually have some good news for you because there is no resistance um, developed in this parasite uh, at all and we're still waiting for it to happen it's interesting because we've been treating with the wormers for a long time this parasite just hasn't been able to figure out how to develop resistance and we don't know if it's ever going to so the good news for you is that you can still pick any dewormer on this shelf and it will work against blood worms now just keep in mind that uh, they don't all work against all of the same stages. It's just a matter of their spectrum. So some dewormers will only work against the intestinal stages and others will work against both the stages in the intestine, but also those migrating larvae uh, that I talked about earlier. So um, the parasite apparently also hasn't been smart enough to even figure out how to become resistant, uh, which is interesting because a lot of the other worms already have. And so that's the end of this presentation about the bloodworm parasite. So what do we want to leave uh, with? Well, it is the only true bloodworm. It's the marinara meat sauce parasite that just doesn't seem to be the smartest of the bunch. It um, vaccinates against itself. It hasn't figured out how to develop resistance. And sometimes it causes too much damage. So uh, with that, I thank you for watching. And uh, I'll see you again next time in the next episode. Thanks.